1985's Ultima 4 was the first game in the franchise's second set of trilogies, titled after the fact as the Age of Enlightenment. It brought with it two major innovations. First, a virtue system that tracked the behaviors of the protagonist along eight ethical categories, and second, a quest centered on actualization and personal development rather than defeating an evil villain or saving the world. I'm Michael Corlim, and this is an analytical playthrough of Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. If this is your first time watching one of my videos, this is not a standard Let's Play. I'm going to play the game, but as a means to present a narrative analysis of its storytelling by way of world building, mechanics, dialogue, and plot. I escape over most of the grinding, avoid sequence breaking as much as I can, and focus on deep dive analysis. In later interviews, Richard Garriott would credit fan mail with sparking the urge to make a game based on the player's ethical development. Ultima 3 was a massive success, selling over 100,000 copies, a huge amount at the time, and one that he'd produced on his own. As such, the way he tells it is that he was getting fan mailed unfiltered by the publisher for the first time, and he was astounded by player stories of the murder and killing they'd had to do in the earlier three games, as well as the moral panic about the demon on the cover. This is what spawned the self-reflection leading to the moral framework of Ultima IV's virtue-driven system. However, remember that Richard is a storyteller and that interviews given are a story. The earliest interviews we have tell us that Richard started working on Ultima IV immediately after wrapping up Exodus, and that he'd been inspired by a television special on the Dead Sea Scrolls, specifically about how there were certain Hindu sects that believed that Jesus had traveled to India and become an avatar, or god in human form. While not a religious person, this struck a chord with Garriott. The idea of a heroic ascension to godhood through mastery of a set of virtuous ideals, and as a game developer enamored with systems, he could see a way to create a character development system based around the leveling up of those aspects. I'm not saying that Richard was lying about the fan mail. In fact, something like that very well could have guided the development of the ethical framework we see in the development of Ultima 4. Keeping in mind that he was 22 years old when he started on the game, an age when he might have been trying to figure out what it was like to be an adult, and was probably feeling a bit isolated by Origin's move from Texas to New England. That alienation, his outsider's perspective on what being an avatar meant, and his enlightened self-interest take on Hinduism's moral framework becomes the ethical virtue system we see in Ultima 4 and later games in the series. How successful was he in this development? Well, let's play the game and find out. It was originally released on the Apple II with 8-bit ports for the Commodore 64 and the Atari 8-bit systems, Japanese ports for the MSX, PC-88 and 98, Sharp X68000, and FM Towns computers along with 16-bit ports for the Amiga and IBM PC. This is the version that we'll be playing, the IBM PC, available free through GOG.com using the enhanced VGA visual patch and music from the Apple and Commodore versions of the game, as with Exodus, Quest of the Avatar on PC, initially lacked any music. There are also some minor bug fixes. I'll go ahead and put links to the game and its patches in the video notes. There are also console ports for the Sega Master System and Nintendo Entertainment System. The Sega port is fairly faithful, but the Nintendo has so many changes that it might as well be considered a remake instead, with smaller dungeons and towns and simplified NPC dialogue systems. The game comes packaged with two manuals, first of which is The History of Britannia, a 36-page long book that gives us an overview of the world, now renamed Britannia from the first game Sosaria, along with its history post-Exodus and a bestiary. We get an overview of the events of the first three games, though once again the fact that Ultima 2 was set on Earth is omitted and no science fiction elements are referenced, including the fact that Exodus was a computer mainframe. In fact, from Ultima 4 on, there are almost no science fiction references in the games at all. We're told that after Ultima 3, Lord British united the land under his rule as the Empire of Britannia, bringing peace and prosperity to his subjects. The manual goes on to tell us that the defeat of Exodus changed the physical landscape as well, raising mountains and sinking islands, the bulk of the world becoming a single large continent, explaining why our maps are so different in the newest game. We're also given a brief overview of the monsters we might face, weapons and armor available, and a philosophical overview that hints at the quest of the Avatar without being explicit about what it is, and that we should seek out Lord British to learn more. 
The second manual, the Book of Mystic Wisdom, covers spells. Each gets its own page, giving some flavor text about the spell in question and how it's cast. Not in terms of game instructions, but what actions and words a wizard would actually use when casting the spell. The game also comes with the traditional cloth map, showcasing the location of moon gates and cities, all written in a runic script similar to Vithing Fulthark runes, but not used the same way. We also get a small metal Ankh trinket, destined to be the symbol of the Avatar, a symbol Richard Garriott saw in the movie Logan's Run and thought looked cool enough, even before learning that it stood for rebirth. Let's get into the game. For the first time, we're not dumped unceremoniously into an overworld without guidance. Ultima 4 gives us an opening. The day is warm, yet there is a cooling breeze. The latest in a series of personal crises seems insurmountable. You are being pulled apart in all directions. This is probably very similar to where 22-year-old Richard Garriott found himself when working on the game. Yet this afternoon walk in the countryside slowly brings relaxation to your harried mind. The soil and strain of modern high-tech living begins to wash off in layers. That willow tree near the stream looks comforting and inviting. The buzz of dragonflies and the whisper of the willow's swaying branches brings a deep peace. Searching inward for tranquility and happiness, you close your eyes. A high-pitched cascading sound like crystal wind chimes impinges on your floating awareness. As you open your eyes, you see a shimmering blueness rise from the ground. The sound seems to be emanating from this glowing portal. Two books wrapped in a cloth map and an ankh pop out of the moon gates, the very manuals and feelies that come with the game, and we're instructed to read them. This is a very interesting way of creating immersion. Within the context of playing Ultima 4, we're told that the game's manuals, map, and ankh exist diegetically within the game world. Our character reads them, so we can certainly read them. They are resources that our character has. I would be surprised if this wasn't influenced by the success that Infocom had been having in introducing similar real props in their games. The intro continues and we leave the stone circle to find a renaissance fair, another one of Richard Garriott's interests, and we find our way to a gypsy wagon. She gives us a card reading that segues into character creation. Are we the character from the first three games, The Stranger? Well, this depends. Ultima 4 keeps it pretty ambiguous, and from the opening we're not familiar with moon gates and don't appear to be anything other than a normal human from Earth. The Book of History also implies that the Stranger was a different protagonist in each of the first three games, despite Ultima 2 implying that it had been us who defeated Mondain, and Ultima 3 outright stating that the same hero was the protagonist each time. Ultima 5 will continue these assumptions, and it isn't until Ultima 6 that we're explicitly told that we, the Avatar, have been saving Britannia and Cesaria since Ultima 1. However, we're analyzing Ultima 4 here, so we're going to go with a backstory of different strangers for 1, 2, and 3, and we, the prospective Avatar, have not performed any prior heroic quests in our backstory. This world is new to us, and we are new to it. Character creation in Ultima 4 comes in the form of a personality test to figure out which virtue you think is most important. Each question asks you to prioritize one virtue over another, sort of like a tournament bracket, and the virtue you're left with at the end determines your class. Compassion makes you a bard, honesty makes you a mage, honor makes you a paladin, justice makes you a druid, sacrifice makes you a tinker, spirituality makes you a ranger, and valor makes you a fighter with the leftover humility making you a shepherd. All classes are viable, so you can just answer honestly and figure out which of the game's eight virtues best suits you, or you can target the virtue for the class you want to play. In practice, my personal virtue is probably compassion, bard, but for this playthrough I'm going to target mage because it'll make showing you guys the game's magic system a bit easier, and because the mage's starting location is convenient for the sake of evaluating the rest of the game. Also, I kind of enjoy the irony of answering falsely to get the honesty result. With the final choice, the incense swells up around you. The gypsy speaks as if from a great distance, her voice growing fainter and fainter with each word. So be it. Thy path is chosen. There is a moment of intense, wrenching vertigo. As you open your eyes, a voice whispers within your mind. Seek the counsel of thy sovereign. After a moment, the spinning subsides and you open your eyes to... This. We now found ourselves on an island near the city of Moonglow. 
As in prior games, the Z key brings up our stats, and we can see that we're male, a mage, in good condition, we have 21 magic points, we're level 2, with 16 strength, 22 dexterity, 26 intelligence, 200 hit points, 200 max hit points, 125 experience, and we have a staff and cloth armor. We also have 300 food and 200 gold, handy to be able to see our coins on the main screen. We don't need to mess around with pooling our gold and trading off inventory items like we did in Ultima 3, which is another big gameplay improvement. Our stat screen does not scroll. Instead, we can press left or right to hit different panels for the mixtures, that's prepared spells, regents, that's the ingredients for spells, our items, torches, keys, gems, and the equipment we're not using. We're down to three stats from the prior game's four. Wisdom rolled into intelligence as the general spellcasting trait, and the game no longer maintains separate lists of wizard and cleric spells. Speaking of, let's prep some. Most of the lore about the spells in the Book of Magic Wisdom was just flavor text. The Awaken spell, for example, tells us to blend garlic and ginseng, then apply the mixture to the brow of a sleeping companion and chant Levate. The spell is actually cast by pressing C, the keyboard command for cast, and then A for Awake. However, you do have to mix garlic and ginseng first. There are eight different regions in the game, and to cast a spell you need to pre-mix the correct recipe. And you can't do this in combat. That, more than your MP, is the limit on casting spells, and the ingredients can be expensive, costing a total of 5 to 45 golds per casting. This limitation becomes the primary restriction on spell use. We have some ginseng and garlic which we can mix for either awaken or cure spells. We're going to mix them into cure spells because getting poisoned is really easy and it kind of sucks. We press M to mix, C for cure, and then the letter B and C to indicate the regents. If our finger slips or we make a mistake, the regent is wasted, even if they would have worked for a different spell. We could suck up on more ingredients here in Moonglow, but our first order of business is to head to Lord British to get our main quest, which we can do through a nearby Moongate. As we head off, we can see that our standard display in the upper right shows our party members, their current hit points, and their condition. G for good, P for poison, S for sleeping, or D for dead. We also see we aren't eating food as fast as we have in the earlier games. The moon gate pops up. This time, each one takes us right near a town, and they're a little easier to navigate than in Ultima 3. The cloth map coming with the game shows us where each gate leads during which phase, but it isn't tied to where they're appearing, meaning the player has to puzzle out the exact schedule. We emerge in a field near the coast, and it's just a short trip west to the castle. We can see here that our left window world view is similar to that in earlier games. We have our moon phases at the top and the direction of the wind at the bottom. Which means that, yes again, we do have to wrestle with the wind to sail. We go to the castle. Note that you must enter it from below, it's solid from the top. And we run into our first NPC, a bouncing jester. So one of the big innovations in Ultima 4 is that we can now talk to NPCs about various topics. After Ultima 7 or so, you can select dialogue options from a menu, but in 4, 5, and 6, you need to type in keywords. This is very similar to what we saw in Infocom's Deadline, where you could ask an NPC about a topic. These conversational gambits may give you other keywords to follow up on, either with the same NPC or others. Almost every NPC in the game has unique dialogue this time around for the various topics, and talking to these NPCs is how the game gives us clues, characterization, and world building. In short, the game's narrative. Of course, each character only responds to a few keywords, but there are a set that every NPC reacts to. Name, job, and health. We ask name. I am Chuckles. This, again, is the in-game avatar of Chuck Buche, Richard Garriott's high school friend and one of Origin System's founders. He was also in Ultimas 2 and 3. Job. I am the Royal Jester. Now, these basic questions lead to other keywords that we can use. Jester. Welcome unto Captain Britannia. Hast thou an onk? NPCs will occasionally ask yes or no questions, and we can type yes or no. We do have an onk. One came in the game's box. Then enter in peace. Health. Good, thanks. This is probably the least useful question in all but a few cases. And this is again one area where the Nintendo port really falls down. It lacks the conversation trees, and each NPC speaks in the single conversations that are more common in Ultima 3 and the JRPG styles of the time.
We find Lord British up on the second floor, and this is the reason why we're here. At long last, thou hast come. We have waited such a long, long time. A champion of virtue is called for. Thou may be this champion, but only time shall tell. I will aid thee any way that I can. How may I help thee? We can also look at NPCs and get a short description. Thou see the king with the royal scepter. Name? My name is Lord British, sovereign of all Britannia. I rule all Britannia and shall do my best to help thee. And he does. We need to return to Lord British to level up and he can heal our party. Even though the great evil lords have been routed, evil yet remains in Britannia. If but one soul could complete the quest of the Avatar, our people would have a new hope, a new goal for life. There would be a shining example that there is more to life than the endless struggle for possessions and gold. Lord British here is making it seem like his subjects are a bunch of amoral, greedy jerks. The quest of the Avatar is to know and become the embodiment of the eight virtues of goodness. It is known that all who take on this quest must prove themselves by conquering the Abyss and viewing the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. And there we have it, that's our main quest. To be an Avatar is to be the embodiment of the Eight Virtues. It is to live a life constantly and forever in the quest to better thyself and the world in which we live. The Ankh is the symbol of one who strives for virtue. Keep it with thee at all times, for it is by this mark thou shalt be known. The Great Stygian Abyss is the darkest pocket of evil remaining in Britannia. It is said that in the deepest recesses of the Abyss is the Chamber of the Codex. It is also said that only one of the highest virtue may enter this chamber, one such as an Avatar. So to parse through all this exposition, our goal here is to become a champion of virtue to give the people of Britannia meaning and purpose. That is it, that's the main quest. The eight virtues of the Avatar are honesty, compassion, valor, justice, sacrifice, honor, spirituality, and humility. We can go on and ask him about each virtue in kind, and he'll tell us about the town most associated with this virtue. Moonglow on Verity Isles, where honesty thrives. The Bards of Britain are the most well-versed in compassion. You in the Deep Forest is where justice is served. It comes off like a lot of flavor text, but in truth, this is going to be a new player's chief navigational aid. Look at the cloth map. It's just a mass of symbols and strange runic script, not necessarily a useful cartographical tool. However, the Book of History contains a comprehensive geographical overview that the maps helps us picture, and Lord British's descriptions of the towns ties each to a geographical feature. This is itself a sort of puzzle. We can narrow down where each town is, but we will have to work at it. We can also talk to some of the other NPCs in the castle before we leave. Juliet gives us the tip that the eight virtues form into the three principles. In retrospect, the keyword system works well as a puzzle mechanic, but needing to ask everyone name, job, health again and again is inelegant. You're going to do it to everybody anyway, it doesn't benefit to the player to have them type it out each time. What might work better is to give each character an initial introductory statement that does the job of, well, job, and contains keywords that they can drill down deeper with if they see fit. So you keep the keyword system, but you make the introductory text useful. Here we have the seer, Hawkwind, hidden for some reason, behind some sleep fields. In the first few games, the oracle could be paid hundreds of gold for necessary tips. Hawkwind the seer is the in-game persona of designer Ro Adams, who also worked on the Wizardry and Bard's Tale games. His job here is basically to tell us how we're doing when it comes to each virtue, and how close we are to the mastery we need to seek. Each of the eight virtues is tracked individually, Starting at zero, you need to hit a hundred in each. This is a very procedural system. As I said in the intro, it's strongly inspired by the Hindu yogi goal of purification of mind and body, 
but filtered through Richard Garriott's lens of game designer and early 20-something moral philosophy. Virtue matters not as an intrinsic, but because a virtuous society is better for the individual. Specific actions raise and lower each virtue rating, sometimes the same action hitting multiple virtues. Narratively, this is explained by the philosophy that all virtues are the combination of the principles of truth, love, and courage. They overlap like a Venn diagram. Of course, from a design perspective, eight of anything is tricky to keep distinct. That's probably why Richard Garriott pared it down from his initial goal of 16. Sisha here gives us our first real clue. Seek out the smith named Zircon and Minok, for he made the mystic arms, only they will serve thee in the abyss. As we had the mystic weapons and armor in Ultima 3, we get some in 4, and like in 3, we're going to mostly ignore the swords because ranged weapons are superior. Shelia here goes on to tell us that in order to enter shrines, we need runes, and we need to know the mantra when we're meditating. Those are basically three of the four components we need to improve any given virtue, the fourth being actually raising its rating. We're ready to set out and start our quest to embody the virtues, enter the abyss, and view the codex. This is an open world game, and aside from a few islands without moon gates, nothing is barred from us. We're heading to Britain because it's the closest and most obvious destination, and our sole hint points to Minnock, a town that's a good deal away. Okay, here we are in our first fight. The separate battle screen that we had in Ultima 3 are back, and our tactics are going to be mostly the same, with the caveat that we only have a staff at the moment and we need to mix regions to cast spells. I'll be honest, I'm not going to bother with damaging spells because a sling is better than the weak spells, and by the time we've leveled up the stronger ones, it won't matter. Enemy AI is much stronger than it was in Ultima 4, and as you can see, they try to run if you hurt them, meaning that you have to either chase them down or use missile weapons. One of our orcs escaped, which means that we lose out on those XP, but we do get the chest he left behind. We open it, and like in 3, chests are usually trapped. They won't kill us right away, but someone will poison us, and that means we have to waste a cure spell. Still, they give us enough money that the tedious grind we faced in Ultima 2 won't rear its ugly head. 74 gold is not bad for two orcs, but it'd be the same random amount if we killed six dragons. On into Britain. Towns are bigger than they were in Ultima 3, they have more variety and their own definite character. Britain was lauded by Lord British as a center of the arts and home to the bards. Our game plan in each town we visit is going to be much the same. Talk to everyone, follow up on their keywords, learn about the local shrine and its virtue. Pepper here is a bard, and she asks if we're looking for something specific. Not all NPCs with information will just give up the keywords we need to ask them about it. Often, we need to be pointed back to them by someone else who will let us know what we can ask about. We could try brute force, asking everyone about every keyword we discover, but that sounds honestly tedious, and the game is pretty good about helping us know who we need to go to. Most of the time. Shapiro here tells us that the Shrine of Compassion is to the east, past two bridges. As you can see, each of the major towns is centered around a single virtue. Almost everyone will be thinking about that virtue, so it really makes you wonder why Lord British is so concerned with the ethical values of his people. Sebastian tells us that Mondain's influence has not left the world. He was the evil wizard we fought all the way back in Ultima 1. We promise to destroy the artifact that remains, and he tells us to ask about the skull at the pub in Buccaneer's Den. Pubs were great sources of rumors in the first three games. In four, each barkeep does have an important clue, but only one, given if you overpay for ale with 99 gold as a tip. But you have to know what to ask about first, because it uses keywords. Ultima 4 continues the trend started with three, in that most of the game is told through conversations with NPCs. 
It's still chiefly expository. Most of the dialogue is either irrelevant fluff or explicit instructions, but the characters themselves are starting to have stories that we learn about. They have pasts, they have drama that doesn't involve us. There's more depth to the narrative world, more moving parts. I am a child. Children don't talk that way, Richard. I am learning compassion. Never care for yourself so much that you cannot care for others. Know ye the mantra of compassion? No? Ask Cricket. So, there is a mantra associated with each virtue. We need to use this at each shrine when we meditate, and this mantra isn't, unfortunately, common knowledge. I am Gweno. We met Gweno in Lord British's throne room in Ultima 3. Beggars are thankful for small donations. That's a pretty big tip as to how we're going to be grinding compassion. Yolo here is our first encountered recruitable character. He's a bard, has average magic points, but great dexterity. We're limited to party size, equal to our level. At level 1, we're alone. Level 2, we can have two party members, three at level 3, and so on. In this playthrough, I'm not going to recruit a party until I'm much closer to the endgame for the simple reason that the game scales battles to your party size. As much as a bigger group can help, it can also make combat more complex and take much longer. This was one of the reasons I chose Mage as a class. I'll have access to all the spells that I'll need alone. This isn't necessarily the best way to play the game for fun, or if you're playing it for the first time. It's just the way I'm doing it for this analysis. I'll still have plenty of time to experience large group combats. The NPCs don't engage with the game in any other way. Sprite here is a beggar, and she gives us a tip in exchange for the promise of help. Pepper, who we've already met, knows of the rune. This is the third component of what we need for each shrine. Since we were appointed here, we know to ask Cricket about the mantra. It's Moo. Mentor's information here isn't vital, but it is good foreshadowing. Magincia was, according to Lord British, destroyed by pride. Finally, we return to Pepper, who tells us that the Ruin of Compassion lies at the end of a hall somewhere in this town. Well, I can only remember seeing one dead end hall, so... Yep, there we have it, Ruin of Compassion. Alright, we're gonna go save, then visit Lord British. Collecting quest items gives us XP in the game, and the Ruin here gave us 100, enough to get us to level 3. We're going to want to visit Lord British again before we have enough XP to hit level 4, simply because if we skip levels, we get fewer attribute bonuses. Simply collecting all the quest items in the game will get us close to our max level of 8, so we won't have to grind for XP much, but there are, will be other things to grind for. In fact, we're going to have to grind our compassion to max before visiting the shrine. Fortunately, compassion is an easy virtue to improve. All we need to do is give a coin to a beggar like Sprite, leave town, come back and do it again. Each time raises our compassion percent up two points, and we started the, with a pretty decent head start due to the way we answered the character creation questions, so it'll only take us maybe a dozen or so trips. Combat is a lot easier with our sling. The biggest concern becomes enemies running away before we can get the experience for killing them, so best practice is to let them get close enough first. Ranged enemies can fire horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, which we can't, so hide behind a rock or in their blind spot until they're closer. Now, before I dig into the meat of the game's ethical framework, I want to be very clear that I'm not being critical here. I am not trying to diminish the importance of Ultima IV's virtues as the first system of its kind in a computer role-playing game. I like it. I think it works as a mechanic and as a cosmological worldview for the setting. And I want to be clear, I'm only addressing this as it appears within the context of the game Ultima IV itself. I'm not judging whether it's good or bad, I'm simply describing it as a function and its implication as an aspect of the game's narrative, because that's what my analysis is. 
The whole process is very orthopraxic. I mentioned this before, but if you're not familiar with the term, you've probably heard of orthodoxy, which is more common in modern religions, but back in the days of ancient Rome and classical antiquity, it wasn't so much believed that the gods cared what you believed, so much as they cared that you were observing the proper rites and rituals. Orthopraxy is a focus on correct action, as opposed to orthodoxy, which is a focus on correct belief. The world Richard Garriott is presenting to us through the fiction of Ultima IV is very much one in which actions matter far more than faith. Part of this is just a matter of coding. You can't tell what the player is really feeling, you can't test whether their character is truly compassionate or just going through the motions, but there's nothing preventing us from using little tricks like repeatedly giving a single gold coin to a single beggar to become a paragon of virtue, because that virtue only exists in the act of manifesting it. If the code is the physics and metaphysics of the game world, then that is literally the way the world of Britannia in Ultima IV works. You might think that I'm picking at nits or taking a postmodern deconstructive view of the nature of morality here, but the game reinforces this enlightened self-interest at every turn with nothing to counter it. We are never told that there's a deeper reason to be good than to become the Avatar. We are never told we are supposed to become the Avatar for reasons other than Lord British wants an external example for his people. We are engaging in ritual behaviors again and again to purify ourselves according to the real and demonstrable moral laws of the universe. Our virtue, or lack of virtue, has a real and measurable impact on the world and the way it reacts to us, and this is entirely achieved through practical actions not belief. I don't want to front load my analysis of the virtue system too much, so for now I'm just going to say that it's still tremendously impressive for a game that came out in the mid 80s by a 20 year old without a formal education in philosophy or game design. Richard Garriott may have completely misunderstood the Hindu concept of Avatar, but he did so in a consistent enough fashion. So let's go check in with Hawkwind. Compassion is a virtue that thou hast shown well, seek ye now elevation. Go to the shrine and meditate for three cycles. That is our signal to go for it here. The Shrine of Compassion is west across two bridges and a toxic swamp that actually poisons us. Fortunately, a cure spell handles this before we take too much damage. Another benefit to going solo is that we only need the one cure spell when we get contaminated. You enter the ancient shrine and sit before the altar. Upon what virtue dost thou meditate? It asks us, even though we can only meditate on the correct virtue in each shrine without it kicking us out, and since it tells us which the right one is right there on the screen, there's really no reason for it to even be a question. Likewise, there's no real reason not to meditate for three cycles, though if you meditate for fewer, the game gives you tips as to what you can do to raise your virtue if it's not high enough. However, you'll have to come back after a moon cycle because you can't meditate too often consecutively. We are now one-eighth of the way to Avatar, and we get a weird CG vision. This picture is part of the, of the VGA patch. In the original, all you got was that cross, which is the letter in the Ultima's runic alphabet, which is sort of, but not really like the Viking Filthark runes. This one is N, and when you have all the letters together, you can unscramble them for an English word that you'll need at the end of the game. We can still lose our Avatar 8th if we act with a lack of compassion, specifically initiating combat with a non-evil creature, so don't do that. We did get a few leads towards other quests in Britain, and this is one of the big improvements in Ultima 4. We often have an idea as to where to go next. We can't do anything about Mondain's skull at the moment, we'll need a ship for that, but we were told that Zircon the Smith in Minoc made the Mystic Arms, so presumably he's a solid lead. As to navigating, the manual gives us a geographical overview, and Lord British told us that Minoc is on the eastern shore of Lost Hope Bay, so our next destination is the City of Sacrifice. In Ultima IV, Sacrifice is raised by getting killed in battle or by donating blood, which we can do here in the castle because Lord British will heal us for free. It chops off 100 hit points, and they won't do it if you're under 400, so you have to be at least level 4. Grind some XP around the castle first if you need to, then just run back and forth between the throne room and the healers until you're full up. Picture that for a second. Lord British, Monarch, can completely restore all of your health. 
yet his healers rely on donations for enough plasma to take care of the wounded. So why doesn't Lord British just heal everyone? He can seemingly heal you infinitely without limit or restriction. Is this a case of the state taking care of its agents but forcing the poor to come up with their own health care? Or maybe it's because you and Lord British are both from Earth and he can't heal the natives. The most likely scenario is that we simply needed a mechanism to increase our sacrifice virtue and giving blood is more palatable than letting yourself get killed in combat again and again. This reinforces the orthopractic nature of the virtue system. The godlike Lord British allows the suffering of the injured to give us the opportunity to be virtuous. This is literally why it exists from a game mechanics perspective, but it works as part of the framework within the narrative structure that is the game's setting. Bad things happen to give virtuous people the opportunity to act in an ethical fashion. Let the implications of that sit with you for a moment as we continue our journey to Minoc. As you can see, while I was grinding to level 4 so I could donate blood, I left the treasure chests behind. Because if I'm poisoned, it will require to meet it to ways to cure a spell, and they don't sell regents in Britain. I've got a limited supply. So if I grab them now though, that's one potential casting instead of the five I would need if I grabbed them the moment they dropped. And I get lucky to not need the spell at all this time. It's a long way to Minoc, far to the east. Ultima's Forest Britannia is a shocking 16 times larger than the world map was in Ultima 3. 256 by 256 tiles compared to the earlier game 64 by 64. And even with the map, a good deal of gameplay without a guide or prior experience would be spent trying to figure out where everything was. Here we are in scenic Minoc, a crafting town and home to the Tinkers. The big deal of virtue here is sacrifice. Mike Ward was credited as one of the playtesters on Ultima 3. He mentions that Scarabray's rune has gone missing. This will matter to us later. Azure here carves runes and tells us to seek out his sister Mischief for information on the sacrifice rune. Maybe she stole it from him. Careful here, some of the floor is poison swamp. Madeira clues us in that the shrine is on a lake to the east, and that a hidden shepherd knows the mantra. So we have the location of the shrine, and a lead on the rune and mantra. Julia is another potential recruit, a good melee fighter, but again, we're not going to recruit anybody until we're done running around collecting things and solving puzzles. Alkyrian, like Pepper was in Britain, is asking us what we want to know. No leading keywords here, so we'll just make a note of where he is. This is a definite type of NPC. The guys who knows something useful but won't say what. Jude here is all mystery, at least until later in the game, alluding to some unspeakable sins he needs redemption for. Again, we should make a habit of noting where NPCs are, especially those that seem like they'll become important later. There's a lot of people in the game, and it is easy to forget where you met someone.
Sing songs, not very good song is actually the mantra of sacrifice. Ka. Uh, I'm not going to bother finding the hidden shepherd because that's really all he's going to tell me. All right, it's Zircon, the guy we were looking for, who forged the mystic arms. He tells us that he gave them to Sir Simon and Lady Tessa. This is a slight break in the mystic arms clue chain, as the only way to find Simon and Tessa is to stumble across them in another town. No one will tell you where they are. But a big part in Ultima IV is wandering and exploration. We will eventually find them just by virtue of talking to every person in every town, or in this playthrough, because I know exactly where they are. Last person we need to talk to is Azura's sister, Mischief. There she is. The Rune of Sacrifice is hard to get. It lies within the fires of the forge. Hast thou the rune? No, return when thou dost have it. The rune being in the forge epitomizes the problems with the virtue system. To get it requires sacrifice, but that sacrifice exists in a vacuum. Sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice without serving a greater purpose, as if it had inherent value. And in Britannia, I suppose it does. Each step in the forge only hurts a little, but we need to search every square and each step takes multiple turns. Okay, we found the rune. Mischief tells us to ask Alcurion about the stone. So there are runes and there are stones associated with each virtue. The runes we used at each shrine to meditate, the stones will come into play later near the end game. Alright, where was Alcurion? The stone of sacrifice is orange in color and used in the altar rooms of love and courage. The stones we will be collecting lie in each of the dungeons. The dungeons also contain altar rooms. See, Richard Garriott's idea of virtue is that each is made up of different fundamental components of love, truth, and courage in different combinations. Much like his ethic system is very structured and centered around praxis, the metaphysical construction of the virtues is also very neatly tied up in its own sacred geometry, chiefly because it looks cool in an all-things-are-related-to-all-things kind of way. What we do as humans is create patterns and slot everything into those patterns, and Garriott's creation of Ultima's virtue system is an excellent example of that pattern building. Even if it's mostly superficial, it gives a young and impressioned brain a lot of ethical hooks to hang from. And I am saying ethical here, not moral, because there is a difference. Morality is your personal sense of right and wrong, and ethics is the communal understanding of good and evil within a social structure. The virtues are ethics, but there's little altruism. Ethical behavior is good because it benefits you personally on your quest for avatarhood, and ethical behavior benefits individuals because it is easier to thrive in an ethical society. Or, to put it another way, we are not good people because it's good to be good, we're good because we benefit from setting the example as an ethical paragon. Again. There's nothing wrong with approaching social good from self-interest as long as the outcome remains a social good. The next game, Ultima V, plays with this and subverts it a bit. A short trip east and we find the shrine on a little island. We meditate for three cycles and get another vision identical to the first, another letter N. We are now one quarter of the way to Avatar. We're also pretty beat up right now, so we're going to divert south to the town of Vesper. There's not a great deal of interest there for us at the moment, but they do have the cheapest inns. While Lord British can give us instant healing, we can also camp out in the woods, though we're likely to face an attack, or we can stay in these inns. I kind of get the impression that Vesper was founded by the survivors of Magencia, but I don't really have any concrete proof of this. Mm -hmm. 
Jem gives us the clue as to the humility mantra without telling us what it really is. Simple tells us that the Shrine of Humility lies on the north bank of the Isle of the Abyss and is guarded by endless hordes of demons. That is a bit inaccessible to us at the moment. Guild shops here, like they were in the previous games, we can get magic keys, gems, and torches. This is the easiest one to reach so far, but we don't need any right now, so we're going to ignore it. There we go, 1 GP, and we get to sleep somewhere safe and restore our health a little. One last thing to handle here in Vesper. Flatbush the Apprentice tells about Calumny, his teacher, and you, and tells us he knows the Quickness spell. While the Book of Magic lists most of the spells in the game and their recipes, they aren't always the most efficient way to make th the regents. There are a few spellcasters you can track down to teach you a better formula and even entirely new spells. We're off along the coast to pause now, which doesn't directly have a virtue associated with it. We'll be visiting often as they have an easily accessible regent shop. The bard here is one of the very few NPCs who mentions that we're from Earth. Oh, here we go, Sir Simon and Lady Tessa. What a coincidence. Unfortunately, they won't talk to us about the mystic arms and armor until we are a full-on avatar, but at least we know where they are now. In a shocking departure from the earlier games, horses are actually useful in Ultima 4. Pause is the place to buy them. Jingles here tells us about his master Mentorian, who knows the Gate spell, a spell that, when cast, will send us to any of the town's Moongate points. It's not listed in the Book of Magic Spells, it's secret along with one other spell, and can only be learned from Mentorian. I mean, if you know what the regents are, you can just ca mix it up and cast it, but the only legit way to learn it without sequence breaking is by following this quest line to the Hidden Village. Alright, we've seen everything, where are the regents? Look at the wall tile there on the right, between the tables. See how it's different? That, my friends, is a secret door, and you need to keep an eye out for them. We can just walk right through into the regent shop. Funny thing, all of the apothecaries running these shops are blind. Must be the fumes. This means we can pay them whatever we want for the regents we purchase, from nothing to overpaying. However, cheating them hurts our honor, honesty, and justice virtues, and paying the correct amount helps those virtues. There's no shrine in Paws, but we're close to Trinsic, which hosts the Honor Shrine. Finding quest items will also help our honor, and unless we go around stealing, it'll naturally max out over the course of the game. But there's no need to wait since we're so close to the shrine. We're just going to grind honor by making a lot of small purchases from the apothecary and giving her exact change each time. It's the honorable, honest, and just thing to do. We 
could load up on all kinds of spells, but for now we're sticking to Cure. Poison is our biggest irritant, and this way we don't have to be so careful about opening chests. Beside, as I said, our sling is just as good as a missile spell and doesn't cost three golds worth of ingredients per shot. The sad fact is that combat magic just isn't worth it in Ultima 4, with the possible exception of some of the higher level kill everyone spells. Sleep might be a good alternative, but that's 15 gold per casting. Maybe the best option is something like negate magic which keeps enemies from putting your whole party to sleep, but that requires regions we can't buy yet. Ultimately, I have to say that the most useful spells in the games are the utility spells. Curing poison, casting light, dispelling energy fields, jumping down up and down dungeon floors, and teleportation. Alright, I feel like we have enough. We're going to continue south, down the coast, to Trinsic, the City of Honor. Dupre here is a paladin, and another one of our companions. Very strong, not very fast, which means not very suited to our ranged focus combat style. Dupre first appeared in Ultima 2 on a world holding nothing else of interest, so we didn't bother visiting him. Durgan here tells us that the shrine is south and west beyond the swamps. Good things we stocked up on cure spells. Winthrop is a rumor monger. We'll probably be back when we know what to ask about. Klein is useful. Quizzes us on what we need to enter the shrine, then tells us the mantra, sun, and that Winthrop knows where the rune is. So, back around to him. Well, Renthrop didn't actually know. Instead, he sends us after a kid named Terran. Quix also redirects us, telling us that a skeleton knows about the Purple Stone of Honor. We meet Virgil on the other side of this poison field. Guy loves poison, but doesn't have anything super useful for us that yet. Aristotle is quoting Aristotle here. There are a few moral philosophers scattered around the game, including, and I kid you not, Paul and Linda McCartney. His question here, are you honorable at all times, is a test of humility. There are a few NPCs asking questions like this, always go for the humble answer as it's the only real way to build up your humility virtue. Sailor Sam kicks off the quest to buy a sextant, which is a tool we'll need much later. Now, you might think we have to kill this bull, but you'd be wrong. It's not hostile, despite Terran's fears, and to initiate combat would ding several of our virtues along with setting all the guards against us. Oh hey, skeleton. Presumably the one Quix was looking for, unless there were a few wandering around. We ask him about the stone. He's seen it used at the altars of truth and courage. Fortunately, the bull wandered off. 
We could have just lied and told the kid it was gone, even if it was standing in front of his face, but it really doesn't matter, because all we really need to do is ask him about the rune. And there we have it, the Rune of Honor, lying on the ground near the Poison Wizard. We're off to the Shrine. We meditate and get a vision of the rune, which I think means the letter I. We are now three-eighths of the way to Avatar. Now we need to head back around through the north, but first I forgot something intrinsic. I try, in these walkthroughs, to avoid sequence breaking by following the flow of conversation and not using clues that I know about as someone who's played the game before, but haven't encountered in play. So when Swindrink here asked me about the most powerful regent, I said I didn't know because, well, I forgot that it was in the manual. So technically having access to it, I don't need to pretend I don't know about it to avoid sequence breaking, and I can tell him the answer is Mandrake Root. He sends us to the Folly Tavern. While Mandrake is mentioned in the manual, it is not available in shops. This quest chain will help us establish a supply necessary to cast some of the most powerful spells, including that gate spell that we don't know yet. Fortunately, the Folly Tavern is just back up here in Paws, so we tip 97 gold for a 2 gold ale and ask Greg about the Mandrake route. He tells us, in return, that the last person he knew about it was the alchemist Kalumni, who we're already looking for with regards to the better way to cast his quickness spell. And of course, since we're near the Regent Shop now, is a good time as any to stock up, so we buy some and mix up a bunch of cures, heals, lights, exits, level up, and level down spells. It'll be a while before we hit the dungeons, but you can never be too prepared. We head back to the castle, check in with Hawkwind, and it looks like looks like Justice is ready for Avatar Hood, but the others still need some work. We go to Lord British to heal up, and our horse can't climb stairs, so we dismount. Brood to ride into the throne room anyway. And ding, we're level 5, out of 8. There are only 8 levels in the game, and without stopping to grind, we're doing a good job of advancing quickly as a solo party. Lord British nags us about recruiting some friends. We could get 4 at this point, but no, I'm, I'm good. I will have to spend some time grinding everyone's XP later, but trust me, it's nothing compared to the time I'm saving keeping combat small. We head back down, and our horse is gone! And that's right, I forgot. If you bring your horse into a town or castle and leave it there, even just to go up or down a floor, it vanishes. 
So now I need to go all the way back to pause and get a new one. Not really a big deal, but I'm kicking myself for the mistake. So our next stop is you in the Great Forest because one, our justice is maxed out and we can go get our avatar on. And two, that's where Calumny is and we can get our find out about the Mandrake Root and the Quickness spell. Visibility is limited in the forest, but fortunately it's not too hard to find. Just go here and head straight north. I'd probably need to search the forest row by row if I were trying to locate it for the first time. Yu is the city of justice, and it's full of druids, the judges and lawgivers of the ancient Celtic people. Janna here is a potential companion with great magic, dexterity, and ranged capability, but again, we're still going solo for now. Druid here, that's, that's his name, tells us the shrine is northeast and that Talford knows of the rune. We're going to lie and say that we have the rune because there are no consequences for being dishonest if nobody catches you, and because I don't want to walk back here later. Druid tells us that the green stone is in the dungeon wrong. We tell Pinrod that we fight for justice, and he tells us that the druids chant the mantra. Those over by Janna were saying, beh, beh, so I assume that's what he meant. Telford is the judge here, telling us that the rune is hidden well. He asks if we're honestly guilty of no crime, and we admit we're probably guilty of something. He tells us to do penance in the cell and search with the felon. Given that this is in connection to the hidden rune, it's definitely a sly way of telling us where it's hidden. Why Telford keeps an important spiritual artifact in a cell with a felon, I don't know. The guard tells us the right-hand cell is for felons. Tilting my head sideways, I see he means the top one. Door ain't even locked. I guess the jail's on an honor system here, and there's the rune. We try talking to Vorpal, and he attacks us. The guards don't care, nor do they appear to care that we're leaving the cell. So hey, you know, honor system. Oh hey, it's Calumny. I've been looking for you. He tells us that the quickness spell only requires one blood moss, not two as is written in the book. It doesn't matter, I will literally never cast this. Asking about Mandrake, however, he tells me it's only found in the fens of the dead and in the bloody plains where the ground is always wet. These are fairly obvious tiles that we can search for Mandrake, though it's not always blooming and doesn't show up on the map that way.
Short round here works for Jones. That's right, it's Keihei Kwan, the actor from the Temple of Doom and Goonies series movies. In a weird pop culture anachronism that Lord British couldn't resist, adding as an Easter egg. He asks if I'm having fun, and I say yes, I'm having a good time. He tells me to write Lord British and tell him. So I did. Richard Garriott liked the tweet. Absolutely reach out to the guy for this kind of stuff. He loves it. This looks like a good point to break off part one of our analytical playthrough of Ultima 4. We've managed to get a quarter of the way to full-on Avatar by mastering the rituals for compassion, honor, and sacrifice. My interpretation of the virtues is, of course, not the only possible way to take it. I would love to hear what you think about Ultima 4's ethical framework, especially if you got something of real-world value out of it. Let me know in the comments. Next time, we're going to seek out some justice, then head to Vesper for some magic keys.